weight loss transformation can't fix everything. It can't. But what it can do are the things that we should focus on with respect to, you know, the transformation. What can it actually impact? Sure. Will it affect mental health? Likely. Will it affect positivity? Likely. Might that impact relationships? Very likely. Mm -hmm. Might that impact communication? Yes. Might you feel better, feel more confident? Welcome to the Wits and Weights podcast. I'm your host, Philip Pape. And this twice a week podcast is dedicated to helping you achieve physical self mastery by getting stronger, optimizing your nutrition, and upgrading your body composition. We'll uncover science backed strategies for movement, metabolism, muscle, and mindset with a skeptical eye on the fitness industry so you can look and feel your absolute best. Let's dive right in. Welcome to another episode of Wits and Weights. Today we are diving into body positivity, fit shaming, the obesity epidemic food addiction, willpower, and staying on track, and the connection between food and mental health. Joining me is certified health coach, fitness expert, and author, David Greenwalt. He's a husband, a father, a former police officer, gym owner, competitive state-level bodybuilder, and power lifter. In 1997, at age 32, at a body weight of 235 pounds, David discovered an evidence-based approach for getting off his excess 50 pounds, and of course, keeping it off for 25 years and counting. Since 1999, through his company, Leanness Lifestyle University, David has been helping student members from every walk of life lose excess fat, keep the muscle, and manage this crazy life. David, man, thank you for coming on the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. And it, it sounds like you've been in this space for a while, the health and fitness space. You have the gym, you've got uh, the experience both with bodybuilding and powerlifting. You don't often hear that, uh, you know, both sides of of it there and currently health and wellness coaching. So what is the deeper story behind, you know, your life experience that led you to want to help people in terms of nutrition and lifestyle? Yeah. So, um, you know, thanks for asking. So for whatever reason, fitness has been in my DNA since I was a little boy, when I was 10, 11 years old, I wanted the president's council on physical fitness award. We had that in grade school and I wanted that award. I was a BC team af you know, traditional sport athlete. I wasn't I wasn't a starter, that's for sure. I wasn't going to be on the A team. But for whatever reason, fitness just was something that I just, I just, I don't know. I just had a passion for it for, when I was little. So, you know, I've still got the sticker in the patch and the certificate from that President's Council Award, and that's 45 years old and counting now. Um, and I was so proud to get that. When I was a senior in high school, someone who was a year older than me who had already, already developed a really great physique invited me to start come training with him and some friends in the weight room. And I thought, heck yeah, this, I thought his physique is fantastic. Um, love to be a part of that. And that's, that was in 1982. And I've been training uh, without more than two weeks off in a row since 1982. So, uh, so that was the start of my senior year of high school. Um, just kind of took some time, obviously, to develop a physique. I competed in uh, bodybuilding and powerlifting in my 20s and 30s. I was a police officer, um, became an Illinois State Trooper. When I got out of the academy, uh, for the state police, I decided that I wanted to try to start a tiny little supplement company, mail order um, company. And if I, I'd be happy if I could just make enough money with this side hustle back then. We didn't call it that, but if I mm -hmm. could just make enough money to pay for my own protein powder, I'd be happy. <laughs> and uh, and so I'm I'm working forty hours a week in uniform, and I started this tiny little mail order company. I placed little classified ads in the back of mm -hmm. like bodybuilding magazines, Flex, Iron Man, Muscle Mag, and I couldn't afford display ads. That was way too too rich for me, and it was just a tiny little room in my house. There was no internet. I gave a toll free number; people could call. I couldn't even answer the phone because I was a police officer working the road, so I'd have to call them back. And uh, and, and I was old school, man. This is, this is how it was done back then. <laughs> this is how it was done. Yeah. So as it turned out, um, it was as much a surprise to me as it would be to anybody. But over the over the course between like 1992 and 1997, um, I grew that company into about five million in re annual revenue and 45 employees. And so um, I'm still a police officer. I'm still working. I've got this company. I've got, you know, dozens of employees. And what happened was the internet came in and throughout this process, my, my customers had seen me, they knew that I had competed in bodybuilding. They knew I competed in powerlifting. And I also wrote about fitness and health and nutrition hmm. and exercise. And I'd go to the, we had to go to the medical library back then to get research. And I'd had to photocopy 
the papers and then bring them back to my office and then read them and highlight them. And then I'd write about research and I, I tested supplements uh, and I'd send them off to the lab to, to make sure that they were what uh, the company said they were. And so people knew that I was really just just so in on wanting to provide good information, solid, set the record straight type of uh, type of information. So we had tens of thousands of customers through the supplement company and email came. They started emailing me. Hey, Dave, real quick. You get a minute. Don't want to be a bother. Don't want to be a hassle. But if you could just tell me real quick how I could lose 30 pounds and keep it off forever, man. <laughs> Solve all my problems right now. Just quick email be, reply. <laughs> just look, I don't want to be a pest. Just if you just yeah. real quick, you know, and so the thing is, I was so passionate about wanting to help people get from someplace heavier, sure. less healthy to someplace leaner and healthier. <clears throat> I gave it the old college try, but it, it didn't take me long to realize that um, I was doing them a disservice by trying to answer on the back of a napkin, you know. Sure. And so I, between 1997 and the first part of 1999, I wrote my book. It's about 500 pages, and it addressed nutrition and exercise and emotional fitness because I realized even even back then, with as much or as little as I knew, however you want to word it, I knew that emotional fitness was a huge driver of keeping the nutrition and exercise components you know, on, on the consistent road. So got that. The internet was here. My gosh, Philip, you've got email. You've got two-way communication. It's unbelievable. And now you've got this thing called a web, and you've got web, a website you can build. So mm -hmm. I built that with dial-up, no fast internet, getting disconnected every 15 minutes. And I couldn't even be on the phone in the home at the same time you were on the internet. And, um, but built the site and provided uh, an online coaching you know, venue for people to, so we could discuss nutrition, exercise, goal setting, motivation, and all the elements. And there could be a username, password protected area. That was in 1999. And uh, I've been doing that ever since. I sold the supplement company in the early 2000s because I was so passionate about wanting to help people. And I realized that that's what I really wanted to do. I didn't mm -hmm. know when I was in my 20s that that's what I wanted to do. It, it evolved. It developed over, over many years. But once I really started communicating with people in that area of kind of transformation, I was like, this is, this is what I was meant to do. This is where my heart is. This is where I'm, what I'm truly passionate about. And so that's what I've been doing. That's awesome. You know, a lot of people come through as trainers, for example. Uh, it, it almost sounds like you came the the other direction. You had the personal experience, having been a competitor, and then just trying to help people, right? Having those conversations, which even today, that's the way. It's not like that has changed. What's changed is the technology, right? Right. Um, and then you talk about the also the need for emotional fitness, which, as we know, could be 80, 90 percent in some people's journeys of, yes. of what allows them to be successful. So right. before we get into some of the, the mindset stuff and, and body image that you want to talk about, your time as a bodybuilder and powerlifter, first of all, were you doing those simultaneously? Because that sounds challenging. And then, you know, what were those experiences like? Yeah. So, you know, my first bodybuilding competition was when I was in college and I was maybe 20. Um, I didn't, I mean... I knew we, you know, you had to cut calories and whatever, but I was just, I did it so poorly and I had no money. I, I'm in a dorm room. I was cooking peas in a little uh, electric hot pot, you know, boiling them in my dorm room and same thing for chicken breasts. Um, I had no money for, you know, lots of grocery shopping. Um, I was just, uh, just mentally checked out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hated it. Um, I got, Super lean. I was shredded, the whole thing, but I hated it so much. I swore back then when I did that, I swore I would never do it again. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do it again for almost 12 years because I hated it, but I did it so wrong. I just did sure. it with what I knew, you know? Um, but anyway, it, it's, uh, but I, but I did do it again. Um, but I, but I spent a number of years in there, you know, also powerlifting and I didn't, I didn't do a, a, a bunch of back and forth. Uh, between powerlifting and bodybuilding. I was in powerlifting for probably about eight or 10 years, kind of mm -hmm. consistently, okay. um, you know, built the strength that way. Uh, on 510, you know, the highest weight I got to was about 235. And, uh, and then in bodybuilding, I would compete. Um, well, I competed at the NPC Illinois State Championships okay. when I was 42. And that's the last comp bodybuilding competition I've done. So it's been a while. Uh, but I did that at about 190 pounds on stage. And so, that was that. 
And you did that um, the right way the second time around, right? Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> after course, all that, that was, those years, yeah. Yes. And that was, you know, four or five other competitions yeah. after. So sure. when I did come back to it, I said, okay, I know a lot more. Let's come at it uh, more intelligently. Let's learn, you know, let's put into practice what, what you now yeah. know. And it wasn't, you know, it was, it was, I'm not saying it wasn't, I'm not saying it, it wasn't hard. It was hard, sure. but it wasn't like, oh my God, this is, this is insane. I never want to do this again. And it sounds like those experiences would be extremely valuable to you as a teacher and to to relate to people who have to go through not that extreme level of shredding, although perhaps you work with with uh, people who are performance focused, but just the average person right. in understanding how to manage hunger and and uh, muscle loss and all that. But so I think that experience is a good segue into the body image discussion. And um, let's start with the bigger picture, right? The obesity epidemic. If we can start there, what's driving that and what can we do about it? Hey, listeners, this is Philip Pape, and I'm excited to announce our upcoming totally free 21-day challenge starting December 1st. It's called the Wits and Weights No Diet Holiday Body Recomp Challenge. This challenge is about learning how to achieve body recomposition, that's building muscle and losing fat at the same time without dieting or restriction throughout the holidays. I'll be giving you free videos, guides, and personalized coaching in a private group chat to help you enjoy the holidays while being satisfied and guilt-free. The kickoff call is Friday, November 17, and the link to enroll is in the show notes, no matter what episode you are listening to. Don't worry, if you're hearing this after November 17, you can still register and get access to the replay and resources before the challenge starts on December 1st. Again, to join the Wits and Weights No Diet Holiday Body Recomp Challenge to build muscle and lose fat without dieting through the holidays, click the link in my show notes. Now back to the episode. So we're, we're not in a good place. And I think that, you know, most people probably already know that, but just kind of by the numbers, we're sitting at 43% obesity for adults in the United States right now. We were 15% obese in 1970. We're 43% today. We're projected to be 50% obese by 2030. Uh, 70% of us are overweight. So things have just gone the wrong direction. Two and a half times more obese now than we were 52 years ago and projections to go up. I see no reason why we won't be 50% obese by 2030 as a society. Mm-hmm. I'm always hopeful. I want to make sure I put this right up front that every single person listening as an individual doesn't have to follow that trend. As an mm-hmm. individual, you can totally win this. But so when I bring bring the the, the gray sky to the conversation, I'm talking societal societal numbers. Population, yeah. Population, you bet. So that, you know, that's that's where we are. So what's driving it? Um what I will say is I'm, I'm big on not being a reductionist, but let me try to simplify it in a way that kind of is reductionist, but kind of not. What I see is the, the number one driver of obesity are all obesogenic factors that contribute to the overconsumption of ultra-processed food, including the fact that ultra-processed food is addictive, which then becomes obesogenic and further drives the overconsumption of ultra-processed food. So all of the factors, external and internal, and there, and there are so many in our modern society. In obesogenic, I just mean that anything, um, that, anything that contributes <clears throat> to behaviors driving obesity, anything. You know, sure. you think advertising, the, the, the number and location of fast food restaurants, convenience yep. stores, 24-7 subsidies. access. <laughs> subsidies, of our, subsidies of our food supply that make packaged foods cheaper. Yeah, Subsidies, absolutely. Um, follow the money. You're going to get a lot of answers to a lot of this. Um, and so you've got, you know, you've got policy and legal being influenced by laws that are created by politicians that have big money from, or money from big food flowing into them. I call it the monkey banana relationship. We're all monkeys going for bananas. And if we understand the relationship of the monkey and the banana, it, we can much more so understand where things don't normally make sense, um, if you understand the monkey banana relationship, things will make a lot more sense. We may still hate it, we may still mm-hmm, disagree right. with it, but at least you go, oh, okay, that's what's going on. So money flows into the politicians. Um, we do have organizations that are, you know, at the federal and government level and state level and so forth that are in charge of kind of health and uh, putting out the message for nutrition and obesity and health and wellness and all that. 
That is also influenced by, uh, by big food and money. Um, the American uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which certifies every registered dietitian in the country, is influenced by big food. Um, they, are, they are invested in big food. Big food's invested in them. And if anybody thinks that there isn't, in, there isn't an influence in their messaging that comes out, I, I don't know what to say. I just say mm -hmm. that there absolutely is. All of the, and here's the thing. I want to make sure I'm clear on this too, because some people, you know, can get, people can get really riled up. Yep. Um, I am not someone who says these are evil people. These are malevolent people. These are maliciously people. And we should stand in front of their house. And with, sure. you know, I, I, this is not, this is not me at all. I think that these are generally really good, decent people just trying to live life and contribute in the way they think is meaningful and da, 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 da. But in the end, and well, trying yeah, and there's to all, things. Well, and there's also the incentives, right? I mean, behavioral economics, it's incentives. They're trying to make a living like the rest of us. Yes. Yeah. Monkey banana. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know? So, so I, I look at them like that, but here's the thing. My, my position on it, by at least understanding, you know, follow the money, the monkey banana relationship, however you want to say it, is it's, it's about more so helping us to understand their relationship so we can adjust our relationship. Right. Right. And it's what, we, it's what we can control, not what we can't. Right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we, you know, we can't We're Here's the thing. I think and I'm a generally very positive person, but I'm a realist. So I think that you and I are probably going to be in our grave before the big societal picture is fixed. But I'm super positive. And again, at the individual level, we don't have to wait for them. We can't wait for a top down approach to fix this. Um, this that's I'm not saying it's never going to happen. Never say never. Um, we're already seeing changes in the uh, in, in processed food as far as what's being put in it, what they're doing to it, because we are voting with our pocketbooks more. We are saying no to the uh, to some of the 3000 industrial mm -hmm. additives that are put in our food supply and what's how it's used and how it's right. made. And, and uh, again, what's the primary driver? What's the monkey banana relationship of big food? It's um, profit. And if they can profit more on pr uh, producing a better product for us, then sure. they'll do that. And if we keep voting with our pocketbook, um, they'll continue to do it. But even so, we can't wait for that top-down approach. It's going to be a bottom-up, and we just we have to just look out for ourselves as individuals. And if so, we're going to be just fine. Yeah. So th there you go. It's it's the buck stops with the choices we make at the end of the day, knowing this context, which I imagine a lot of people aren't fully educated, or you know, there's an unconscious level of you know herd mentality to this whole thing. And I think right. you know, like podcasts like this and and your message that gets out there we're doing our part as best we can and many of us i know i ha i didn't have necessarily the athletic background you did but it took me decades to figure this stuff out myself and and i'm the kind of guy like you positive i think i'm in control i think i know a lot and yeah. still the ignorance yeah. was there despite my right. best efforts so yes um yeah so now we want to talk about body body positivity which is a, is is closely linked to obesity right because we talk about outside factors the obesogenic environment and then perhaps that leads to the thought, well, you're a big person or you're at an obese weight and you can't really help it. And so we shouldn't criticize um, or judge people for how they look, you know, healthy at any size, all of that messaging, which can get thorny and controversial. But right. I know we're going to treat it with the right nuance here and respect. So right. what do you think about that movement? First of all, I, I, I generally understand how kind of despondent uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people are who have tried and battled this hundreds of times. If you consider false starts and start stops and start on Monday and you're done by Tuesday and or whatever, whatever the thing may be, where in the in the environment we're in with the messaging that is that has been given again from top down from top health government, top health EDU, uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, supposed to be the the trusted nutrition source where mm -hmm. you know dietitians and everything, all things in moderation. Um, Eat less and exercise more. Never say no to anything. If you get a craving, make sure you have some. Otherwise, it can do this and do that. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a bad food, um, blah, blah, blah. All of that messaging, first of all, it hasn't worked. Look at us. Look where we are, 43% obese versus 15%. They've done a poor job on getting, if that was their goal, if their goal was to help us stay or get healthy, they have failed. So with that in mind, I, I, I understand because I work with people every single day who are not completely hopeless. Otherwise they wouldn't find me. There's still, there's still a little bit of hope there, right? Where they're like, Oh, I almost don't believe that it's possible for me to win mm -hmm. this. 
Yes. But I have a 1% tiny little piece of flickering ash in me, you know, mm-hmm. that says, I just don't want to accept where I'm at. I'm, I'm not happy where I'm at. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dissatisfied in so many ways. But I, I understand that since, you know, the failure rate is somewhere between 80 and 95% for keeping it off, you know, mm-hmm. and I get that. It's like, at some point, I think there's this, this movement has kind of been like, look, guys, you know, everything that's been put out there hasn't worked according, you know, when you look at 80 to 95%. Well, if we look at the general messaging, again, top down, big messaging, big influential groups, their messaging hasn't worked. Um, It's not surprising to me that it hasn't worked because it hasn't addressed what I call kind of six pillars that have to be looked at. You need to look at nutrition. You've got to look at exercise. Fine. Everybody looks at that. That's usually what people are thinking, by the way, when they say, I know what to do. I just need to do it. Mm -hmm. And when they, when they say, I know what to do, I just need to do it. And I know I'm tangenting, tangenting here a bit. They're, they're thinking nutrition, exercise, eat a little less and better, exercise a little more and better. I got it. But you don't got it because that's only two of the six. We've got to look at intrinsic motivation, what drives willpower. We've got to look at compulsive eating, uh, addiction. We've got to look at emotional fitness. And then we've got to see what personal, professional, and spiritual support might that person need as an individual. Those are the six pillars, nutrition, exercise, intrinsic motivation, compulsive eating, addiction. That's one. Emotional fitness is a big category in one. And then what level of support will an individual need? Well, I mean, come on, Philip. The average person out there who's been battling this, the average person who maybe kind of as you you segued into, maybe into this, let's just, my God, let's just accept where we are. Let's just say that, heck with it. You know, we've tried, I've tried hundreds of times and so have millions of others. We aren't succeeding. Um, we try to apply the messaging that's been given to us. It doesn't work. I haven't been able to make it work for me and neither have these millions of other people. So, and I've seen, Philip, I've seen researchers, I've written researchers who have given up. Researchers have given up, not across the board, but I've seen them here and there where they're like, uh, basically the best thing someone can hope for is just don't gain any more. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I, I, and I, I write a researcher. I'm like, shame on you for giving up. Shame on you for you with the education you have mm-hmm. and all the resources you have to, to not looking at, I'm going to call it the six pillars, but looking at the other factors that are almost never addressed. Um, but have to be addressed if we want to win this once and for all. This can be won. We, I see it every day with my own clients. Other people see it with their clients. But when people really have put into place what's really necessary to win this, this absolutely can be won. Back to your, your kind of your statement, your question. I don't blame people for being at a point where they're like, man, we just, I just want to at least feel good about life. You know, I yeah. want to feel good about where I'm at. So from a body positivity position like that, I, I very much am sympathetic to it. Um, I, I'm going to say I understand it the best I can. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, but even so, you know, we can we can kind of take it from here. Yeah. So it sounds like the the message here is we're so conditioned to failure. <laughs> we're so conditioned to everything having that we've tried hasn't worked. And even if we think we're doing the right thing, nutrition and training. That's only two of, like you said, the six pillars. I actually like the way you organize that because I haven't heard it quite structured that way, but it's complete. I could imagine a pie chart or something like that, filling in the whole picture. Um, The motivation, the compulsive eating, the emotional and support side are huge, right? They're they're massive. Even so, when you throw in the nutrition and training, I'm sure you've seen that people don't really understand what the right thing is to do many times, even with nutrition and training. Is that true? Right. It is. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people come in, they go, I know what to do. I just need to do it. Nutrition, exercise, got it. Just give me the seven day diet and the exercise plan day. Thanks so much. A little (laughs) accountability again, and I'll be on my Mm -hmm. way. And, Mm -hmm. and here's the thing is that first of all, I don't know what you know about nutrition. You may know some things and maybe you've got it pretty solid, but then again, maybe you don't, there's so much misinformation out there, you know, and I don't know what you've consumed. I don't know what you've read, listened to. So first of all, we really have to make sure without it being dogmatic, overly rigid and all this kind of stuff, um, we need to make sure that they have a a real understanding of uh, nutrition for the purposes of health and fitness. And the same thing for exercise. Do they have what they need to be able to perform exercise in a way that's going to be meaningful to them and and, uh, promoting of uh, health span and lifespan and and all the things they want out of it, whatever that may be, physique and, and whatever it may be. So let's assume that we get that 
to that point. And if I ask someone, hey, what's general? What do we recommend? What's what do we generally mean by you know good nutrition? What do we generally mean by a proper amount of uh, and a proper type and amount of exercise? And let's say they can regurgitate that back. Great. They but but they're sitting at two right now. Got it. Yeah, but you yeah. and but your your process. I, I like your process because and you use use the phrase student member when you talk about your yeah. your clients of getting to getting them to that baseline, right? Because right? you'll you'll have someone come to you and I get this too with interested clients. Well, but I'm doing paleo and running a lot, so I've got that covered. Now, yes. why is everything not working? <laughs> right. I'm like, okay, we have to peel back and get to the premise yep. of all this first and rebuild the foundation. Exactly. Um, so listening to podcasts like this will get you there and listen to what David has to say. All right. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about fit shaming, but I think there's a lot more to cover in the, in the, in the fat shaming or the body positivity, whatever phrases we want to use. Yeah. On the mindset side, um, you mentioned this defeatist mindset, right? Where people have basically given up or maybe yeah. they have that flicker of hope, but it's close. Right. And a lot of people criticize someone for not having willpower, right? That's mm. the common thing. Like if this is all you have to do, and we've established that the, even the basic yeah. education isn't there, but let's say everybody knew the right thing to do. You're just not doing it, right? You just have to, whatever it is, eat less, exercise more, whatever. Right. It's just energy balance. We know energy yeah. balance is true, but but to say that and that you're lacking willpower and people don't just do it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that You know, approach? Uh, so yeah, very, very strong thoughts on that. And I, but I, and I want to just plant this. And if we don't get to it, we don't. But I want to plant this that I, that while I am am a hundred percent, hundred percent all in that every single person has certain mm-hmm. inalienable rights mm-hmm. to love, respect. If you're just trying to be a good person, I don't care what size you are. I don't yes. care at all. Zero care about that, other than the concerns I have with regard to obesity and, and the issues that that uh, relate to that from a health perspective. But as far mm-hmm. as a human being perspective, zero. Love, respect, consideration, empathy, all the things that we as humans should be uh, just granted, period, for being yes. alive. If we're trying to be a good person, I'm 100% all in on that. And if we, if we go back to that, I'll talk about the two concerns I have that have nothing to do with whether someone's good, bad, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not a judgment type thing, but just concerns I have and what is obesity and all that with regard to your, your question um, that you just asked, why don't people just do it? What about willpower? One of the things, you know, when I was telling you that, you know, back in 1997, when people were emailing me, Hey Dave, real quick, if you get a chance, no big deal, Mm -hmm. 30 pounds, keep it off forever. That's still a mindset that's here today where it's minimized, they don't understand what it's going to take. They don't understand what's involved with all that we have going on and how obesogenic our society is and all the forces working against them. One, they don't know what things to look at, the, the, mm-hmm. let's say the six pillars, but they also don't, they also minimize what it's going to take. Everybody eats, everybody moves. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be that hard. We all know Here's the thing. I always say, I can come to your city and stand on the tallest building with a bullhorn and scream, eat less and exercise more. And people will look up and go, yeah, I know. I mean, we there's a there's an inherent understanding of energy balance. We have to take in less energy than we expend. If we do, we'll lose weight, hopefully most of it fat. If we take in more energy you know, than we expend, we're going to gain. And if we take in equal amount, then we'll stay the same. I don't know what it is, 80%, 90% of the people, if you ask them that, they go, yeah, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. So the thing that they're missing, though, is everything else. All that's left is all the rest. And so, um, and all the rest is a lot. So one of them is they minimize the why they're going to need. You know, the the why is so critical. Why power drives willpower. And uh, kind of proof and evidence, just, just a thought exercise is people think they don't have willpower. And I don't think that someone that's 300 pounds, 400 pounds, I don't, I don't think I don't think they don't have, they have willpower. Mm-hmm. They've demonstrated mm-hmm. it over and over and over again. If they work, just as an example, if anybody works for someone else, do you, when was the last time you were late for work? Good point, yeah. I mean, it takes, willpower, my definition, my adapted definition is the the ability to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done, whether you feel like it or not. Mm-hmm. 
you go to work regardless. Well, what about when you're sick? Go to work. What about when you're tired? Go to work. What about when you got two hours sleep and the kid was cr crying all last night with a fever? Go to work. What about when, you know, you just got done crying yourself for 20 minutes because there was a emotional upheaval in the family or you lost a, you, lost, you go to work. It's you go to work. And not only do you go to work, you go to work on time. And not only do you go to work on time, a lot of days you're at least somewhat productive, you know, mm -hmm. you do sure. your job. And so you do these things and that's a huge demonstration of willpower and you have it. Why do people do that? That's the answer. Their why is incredibly strong for keeping the job. All the things that gives them uh, money is one of the things, but also, you know, feelings of co contribution and satisfaction and community and whatever it may be. Um, there's a huge why for why people go to work. Same thing if, if people have young children. When was the last time you didn't pick up your kid from school when they needed to be picked up? Mm -hmm. I mean, did you just say, nah, you know, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not in the mood today? Of course you didn't. You went because even though you were tired, sick, just had an argument with your spouse. Uh, whatever the thing is, you went and picked up the, your child because your why for making sure your child knows they can count on you is so strong. You will do it no matter what. You have an advanced degree. It's hard as hell. Did you always, did you always go to class, study and do the things you needed to do when you were in the mood? Absolutely not. Um, that took incredible willpower. Anything hard, long, that isn't to say naturally in your wheelhouse um, or that you would just kind of choose to do no matter what. Um, some things are just passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. Some things we are, it's like, nobody has to tell me to do X, Y, Z. I love it so much. And even so there's still a strong why there, but it's just more something that somebody's more naturally inclined to want to do things that aren't like that. You've got an incredibly crazy why and why power is driving willpower. When people come at obesity or weight management, they minimize that. They mm -hmm. come at it and just say, Hey, why do you want to do this? Hey, I just want to get a little healthier. Yep. That's not going to work. That's not enough. It's a start. It's nothing wrong with it. It's just not developed. It hasn't been really drilled down into this. We have to get the why incredibly emotionally driving strong, much stronger than what people realize. And so it's a third, it's a third pillar and it's minimized. It's eh. And if there's a eh, we're, it's not going to work. Why? Because the obesogenic environment, the factors that are working against us are so strong. So powerful, yeah. If we have yeah. the why, we can persist. You know, we can persist even though life is throwing us curveballs. We can persist without exception. We can persist no matter what happens. We may not always do it right. We're not always going to wake up every day and slay the dragon. We're not going to do it. But we can do it much more often, much more consistently if our why is strong. So one of the things we do is help our, our student members develop their why, fully develop their why, so that they are really ready to wake up and face the day and be like, okay, yes, this isn't, this isn't something that I kind of want to do or that I've kind of thought about or it'd be nice. Mm -hmm. I, I have to have this. This is yeah. something I have to do. Shout out to Philip Pape. I know Philip for a long time. I know how passionate he is about healthy eating and body strength. And that's why I choose him to be my coach. I was no stranger to dieting and body training, but I always struggled to do it sustainably. Philip helped me prioritize my goals with evidence-based recommendations while not overstressing my body and not feeling like I'm starving. In six months, I lost 45 pounds without drastically changing the foods I enjoy. But now I have a more balanced diet I weight train consistently, but most importantly, I do it sustainably. If a scientifically sound, healthy diet and a lean, strong body is what you're looking for, uh, Philly Pape is your guy. Oh, I just want to explore that one one later deeply because it, it's a common thing I see where people are asked what their goal is, and their goal is, like you said, it's at the superficial level. It's almost the method that they're they're regurgitating as the goal. You know, the the losing fat or the getting fit, right? It's almost the method or, or a small piece of the whole process uh, where the why might be, like you said, emotionally tied to being a role model for their kids and being there when they're older and being able to enjoy these activities that they couldn't enjoy otherwise, et cetera. How do you, what kind of activity or exercise do you go through that maybe the listener can try on their own? So, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that you can do to at least start with is, you know, you want to consider you know, kind of certain categories, you know, um, how might your why just kind of just be thinking about these things. How might your why affect family relationships, mm -hmm. 
professional uh, aspirations, career aspirations. Uh, we know there's bias there. Um, uh, how might it affect um, aspirational things? What are things that you've put on hold? Um, are the, is there anything socially that you want to do more of that you've put on hold or that you avoid because you don't want to be in that situation? It's so common. Um, so those are some things to kind of think of, you know, category. And then also physicality things. I want sculpted shoulders. And I'm not talking mm -hmm. bodybuilder, but, um, you know, let's just say, you know, a common thing for a woman. Again, it varies as or stars sure. in the skies, but it's just a common thing to just a, a woman wants to wear, be able to wear a sleeveless. I'd like to be able to wear a sleeveless and feel good about my shoulders and arms. That's mm -hmm. all. I don't mm -hmm. need to get on stage, but just to feel good about what I'm wearing. Um, I want to be able to shop my closet. I've got four sizes of clothes in my closet. I don't need to go buy more clothes. I just need, I want to fit into the ones I, I fit into. So yeah. those are kind of physicality things. So that's a part of it. Um, kind of looking at all these various categories where, here's the thing, weight loss transformation can't fix everything. It can't. But what it can do are the things that we should focus on with respect to, you know, the transformation. What can it actually impact? Sure. Will it affect mental health? Likely. Will it affect positivity? Likely. Might that impact relationships? Very likely. Might mm -hmm. that impact communication? Yes. Might you feel better, feel more confident? So just as a, a practical exercise, just as a starter, something that I will say is start with, I want blank so that blank. I want blank, so that blank. That's like a, it's like a, a chapter heading mm -hmm. of your why book, okay? You know? Um, and that's important because the first blank is where people often stop. I yes. want blank. That's why I want, blank. I want blank. No, but why do you want blank? Right, so that yeah. what? And then you can start to drill down by saying, let me see if I can just give them a quick example. I want to, let's just say they're going to use a number. I want to weigh 160 pounds so that I fit comfortably in a normal airplane seat mm -hmm. because it, it, people can take it for granted. But if you're, if you're not large, you, you can take it for granted. But if you're large, that's something that I've had. I can't tell you how many clients, just something thing. I want to fit. I want to fit in. So let's just say that's, that's the thing. One no, I agree. This is great. Yeah. It, sorry. I weigh 160 pounds so that I can fit comfortably in a in the center, mm -hmm. not an aisle seat, so I can fit in the center seat of, you know, an airplane. So that, what, yeah, I want to say so that I can do that. All right. So then we go. So the next question would be, it's important to me that I can fit comfortably in an airplane seat because right. what follows the because. So that starts to write the chapter. So the chapter heading is, I want blank, so that blank. But we start to write the chapter when we, we look at whatever followed so that, we look at that, whatever that thing is, and we ask this question. We say it this way. It's important to me that I can fit comfortably in an airplane seat, just as an example, because. And then you start to expand on that. And then that starts to get emotional. <clears throat> you know, sometimes right. the I want, so that is emotional, but that starts to get emotional because then we start drilling down. What does it mean to you to be able to fit in an airplane seat comfortably? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You know, what is that? What difference does that make? Who cares? Well, I'll tell you why. Because of this, I mean, sure. so you start filling in the blank on that, and you can start adding multiple supportive statements to the chapter, and you can just kind of you can kind of start building it that way and start drilling down. So yeah. there are lots of do's and don'ts, but basically, you know, as far as a getting a start, that's a good way to start. And it's something that most people have never heard. Yeah. I love that. You, you put it into a, you put it into a narrative, a story, and it's, there's a drier version of that, that I learned in the engineering world called five whys. And it's a root cause technique where you simply just keep asking why, which is effectively what you're doing, but you're doing yeah. it in a way that tells it into story. You could say, I want this. Why? Because of this. Well, why? Because of this. Yeah. And you keep going down that. You're effectively doing right. that, but it's a very powerful tool because you get to that root cause. Yeah. And the, other, and the other thing you alluded to when some of your examples is it doesn't have to be, I mean, the reason is yours. The reason is your own. Yeah. Like, don't let anybody judge you for it. It no. could be a vanity reason. It could be you know, a very powerful reason. Um, one question I've asked people is what, what would you like to be doing when you're 90? Like what physical feat would you like to accomplish when we're talking strength? What do you want to still be able to do when you're 90? And then kind of let that drive you as well. 
It's good stuff, David. Uh, all right. You know this is good I, stuff. Yeah. Can I just say on the vanity sure. thing? It's a common thing. You just, yeah. I hadn't thought of it, but you mentioned okay. it. And here's the thing. A lot of people will stop short on even putting in their why what they really want mm. because they're afraid they're going to sound vain. But here's the thing. Vanity is excessive pride. Mm -hmm. Excessive pride. Just because you want to feel proud doesn't mean you have excessive pride. It doesn't mean you're standing on a perch. It doesn't mean you're a narcissist. It doesn't mean that you are all the negative things where, you know, you are now looking down on people and you're just feeling pride. I feel proud that I accomplished this. I feel proud. I feel proud. Is it okay if I feel proud that uh, our three grown kids are amazing? I would think it's okay if I, yes. as a parent, feel proud of my kids and that I'm so proud of them and I'm so proud. I can be proud, I hope, that we as parents at least did what we did to contribute in some way to them you know, you know being good. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Why feeling good about that without it being overblown? Do I have plenty of things that I could have, could have, would have, should have, you know, raising our kids? Yes, I still have awareness of that just because I feel proud about it. But why can't we feel that way? Why can't we put that stuff into our why? And I say, do it, put it in there. What do you really want? You know, things that you will feel proud about, put it in there. It's not excessive unless it is. And, um, and unless you're judging others and pointing right. and looking down on others and things like that, if you're not doing that and you're living, let live, do it, put it in there. Man, I love that. That that is really good. I mean, just the fact that vanity is excessive pride, but you just want to get to, you just want to get to a baseline that would make you satisfied with what you've done in life. Right. You know, or even a little more than that, but not excessively. Right. And you alluded to that. Um, don't, don't judge other people, but also if you're listening to this or, um, you know, someone that is trying to improve their life for whatever reason, let's not shame them either. And I see this happen in, in groups or families, particularly where everybody's struggling a bit, right? With their health. Yeah, right. And so one person decides to be the outlier yeah. and, and do something different. And all of a sudden, you know, you're weird. Why are you doing this? Um, there's no way you could get healthier. Look at us. This is the family tree. You're making us look bad or just, just a lack of, you know, an apathy about it. Yeah. The list goes on and people listening and you, David, know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. And there's a phrase, I guess, fit shaming. We can call it yeah. whatever we want. It's that double standard. People criticize others for trying to get yeah. in shape, improve their health and so on. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? <clears throat> First of all, um, there, there, there is a bit of a double standard. Uh, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the compliment that it mostly is, even if it's left-handed to a degree, mm. I'll take the compliment mm. in a day of the yes. week over <laughs> living the alternative. And that's just me. Each person do their thing. But to be able to be fit enough where someone feels they, are, they can be comfortable enough to comment, I'll take that mm. and I'll, I'll, I'll take it. And, and listen, I'm not saying that when I take it, I don't go, oh my God, are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> of course I do. You know, hey, Dave, you know, I don't see any protein in that brownie you're getting ready to eat at the family function. Oh, you, sure yeah. that's, you sure that's got protein in it, Dave? Uh -huh. No, no, it, uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't have much protein. No, it does, <laughs> you know, so, and that's not something you would say. I shouldn't say that. There are people who are cruel. So in my mind, <clears throat> I can hardly picture, because I just wouldn't do it. I would never say to someone who is obvious they're struggling with their weight, da, 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 da. Sure, you want that extra piece of cake, Sally, or mm. whatever at the family? Oh, my God. But I know there are cruel people out there and there are people that are cruel that do that. Sure. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen to them. It does. But what you're saying, you know, it, it, it definitely does happen. I think it mostly or a lot of times is not mean spirited. Sometimes right. it is the, the person themselves who says it may be feeling whatever they're feeling about their own journey. Mm -hmm. they, aren't, they aren't feeling as confident in their own journey. And so or or they just kind of feel like maybe the person is that they're talking to has a level of fitness where they're. I'm not saying they think this way, but so this may not be, be just right, but it's almost like they're wearing a coat of armor, you know, because sure. you're just, you got it together. You're fit. Intimidated you, you know. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And sure. so yeah. you'll be able to take this and you'll know how I mean it and you won't be offended mm. and it won't hurt your feelings. And, mm. but sometimes it does, you know? Um, but even so I'd still rather be in the position I am and go, ah, all right, I got to, again, I'm going to use emotional fitness to process the sting, you know? Right. of someone uh, saying something 
because of the double standard or whatever and just try to get on uh get on with life but does it happen oh yeah 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 it's just a very interesting thing because you do talk about one of the pillars being support and i'm always thinking about you know the people you surround yourself with like you said if it's if it's innocent if it's not intended that way and you you'll you'll probably know that there's nuances in conversation all the time and again, like you said, if you're doing the things you feel are right for you it, with pride and not excessive yeah. pride, you right. just move on and, and you probably have built up some level of, of not, not armor in the way you were intending it, but are a good armor you know, yeah. against those right. kinds of things. Resilience, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, and it just, you know, I think, again, I think generally, generally speaking, if you're really super fit, um, you're going to stand out and um, because that's not the norm. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're truly fit, you know, True. we can define, we can define, you know, health related physical fitness, we can define it, you know, cardio respiratory endurance, muscular endurance, muscle, uh, muscular strength, flexibility, body composition are the five components. If you have all of those high mm-hmm. cardio, muscular endurance, muscular strength, body composition, flexibility, if you have all of those high, you're going to look like it, right? If all of those are high, you're going to look like, bam, that guy's fit or that gal's fit, you know, and you're going to stand out because that is not the norm. True. And you're going to stand out in a positive way. And I think most people, most, um, will look at that person and go, way to go. Mm-hmm. You know, now that may not be what comes out of their mouth. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, but it's true. You're right. You're right. There's, it, there's a piece it, of them, at least, I think for most people um, are, who go, dang, okay. You know, I, maybe they don't think they can do it. Maybe they're like, oh, I could never do that, but good for you. But it also may still come out when you have that piece of brownie at the family function. You know that doesn't have any protein in it, Dave. You know? oh, hopefully it's motivating too. I mean, I, at least I try to look at it that way. Any, anybody that is doing things that I would aspire to get closer to, even though, again, we shouldn't compare ourselves to people because everyone's yeah. different. But at least, you know, using it as a positive of like, okay, I'm going to take those thoughts and I'm going to make them into something that works for me. Right. Um, all right. So. I have a whole bunch more questions, but we don't have a ton more time. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on um, maybe we were going to talk about things like food addiction and flexible eating. So maybe a little talk about the the actual food specifics. Um, You mentioned the, you know, no food is off limits approach or the, you know, there's no good or bad food. We have the concepts of flexible dieting, which for some people, it's different things. I think of it as like what Alan Aragon's kind of uh, path of flexible dieting, where it's uh, not anarchy, you know, it's not, uh, if it fits your macro so much as a macro and calorie guidelines within which you have some flexibility, but you're going to limit your processed foods to an extent. Just go. I mean, tell me what, you, yeah. what, what your thoughts are on the topic. You bet. Um, yeah. So, you know, my thing as far as, again, applying these moral, you know, uh, assessments to what we eat, it's good, <clears> it's bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. Um, healthy, unhealthy, I don't. Yeah. I look at it, are we eating real food and does it work for you? So, you know, I think that, you know, again, I've adapted a working definition of real food based off of a, a, a food classification system called the Nova Food Classification and developed by a professor out of Brazil. It's been around 10, 12 years now. It's, it's making the rounds and has been in the research now for, for quite some time, very heavily being uh, looked at, uh, respected. Nothing's mm-hmm. perfect. Um, it's not either. But I, I really like what Nova Food Classification looks at because they look heavily at the processing. And so my working definition from theirs, again, you'd have to, you know, there are a semester long things that would have to get into their breakdown. But mine is this, you know, real food is whole or minimally processed edible parts of plant and animal, where if anything's been added to it, it's whole or minimally processed ingredients mm-hmm. commonly found in kitchens. So let me say it again quick. Because I think it just kind of people are like, what did he just say? Whole or minimally processed edible parts of plant and animal, where if anything's been added to it, it's whole or minimally processed ingredients commonly found in kitchens. So, you know, it's, you know, you think about your single ingredient things, very common, you know, your single ingredient animal based products, your single ingredient plant based products. Sure. But there's also combination products. Um, that are that are absolutely just fine too. You could have a mar- a, a jarred marinara on the shelf, mm-hmm. and the sure. ingredients could be tomatoes, basil, oregano, garlic, you know, blah blah blah. And as long as those are the ingredients, it's what we would call real food. So um, basically, everything else, even that, is at least minimally processed. But almost everything else, if it's not real food, is ultra processed. Mm-hmm. Not everything. There's nuance to it, and so we want to minimize that. Our goal 
is to try to, right now, Americans are eating 60 to 90% of what they eat is ultra processed food, 60 to 90%. Mm, it's crazy. And so what we want to do, and that's what's happened is that's crowded out real food. It's crowded out. What we want to do is we want to reverse that. And I'm not saying we eliminate ultra processed mm -hmm. food, but I'd like to get real food up to 90%. That's like the pinnacle, you know, 90% intake real food. You go, that's crazy, David. You're insane, dude. Well, that is how we ate for hundreds of thousands of years. It's exactly how we ate for hundreds of thousands of years. We ate real food. It's what mm -hmm. we're designed to eat. Our body knows what to do with it. And as I said at the top of this, what's the primary contributing factor to obesity in the United States? All obesogenic factors that contribute to the overconsumption sure. of ultra processed food. Yes. So we, you know, so we kind of came full circle there. But uh, so you know, with regard to kind of what you were saying, I'm flexible. You know, I, I said this to somebody just the other day. They were like, okay, somebody was trying to kind of help create kind of a vision. This is a different podcast. And their thing was just their whole um, focus was different. But they were trying to create a vision of things, you know, to avoid. And they're like, okay, I would want people to avoid you know, uh, pizza and cookies. And I said, well, it depends. I mean, if you're eating 90% real food mm -hmm. and as a part of your 10%, you can have pizza or cookies or whatever it is. And remember, is it real food and does it work for you? Yes. People will pound their fist. You can do it with, well, you can do it with salted peanuts. They'll pound their fist and go, it's real food, Dave. I'm good to go. Does it work for you? It doesn't right. work for you if you eat the whole jar. Right. Does it work for you? Your goals? Does it make you feel good? All of right. the things, right? Does yeah. It, yeah, does it, do you get gastrointestinal distress? Does it give you gas and diarrhea? Does it cloud your, your brain get foggy afterwards? Okay. Even if it's real food, if it doesn't work for you, we got to figure out what we're going to do about it. So, um, so yeah, we, we have to look at, you know, all, all of these things to really, really get a handle on um, what's really going on. So real food, 90%. That's why generally... Let's put it this way. At least I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that categorically anything's off limits. It's going to vary person to person. Mm -hmm. sure. I just would like to see real food crowd out ultra processed food. That is, that is exactly the phrase I use. I love it that you're saying that. I, and it often starts for me with protein because people are underfed on protein. And yeah. the argument I like to make is if you go to the grocery store and find whatever sources of protein you can, it's very hard to find very much processed foods that are protein you know, high enough in protein and you, you inevitably have to go to the animal and plant sources. It kind of, you know, you're not thinking whole foods necessarily consciously. You're thinking I need to get protein. What's going to serve me? What's right for me? Yeah. Uh, and then it starts to crowd out other things. Well, if I need to get 180 grams of protein, I'm not going to have too much room for these things. Yeah. Now, what about, um, so like whey protein is always brought up with me and, and I think that's pretty much a whole food, but it, tell, tell me what you think. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's arguable. It, it is. It's it's it. I think it's in a in a bit of a nuance. I think that again, if you take a let's just say everybody says whey protein, what whey protein? So spin it around. Let's look at the ingredients. Sure. If the ingredients are you know whole or minimally processed edible parts of plant and animal, where mm -hmm. the only thing added to it is whole or minimally processed ingredients commonly found in kitchens, then you can say it's processed, but it's we could still possibly call it real food. But if you get like a flavored whey protein and now it's right. got 20. Sucrose and, I, you, and artificial it, flavors and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ultra processed for sure. Right. Uh, whey protein and, and lecithin as an emulsifier. Mm. You know, I mean, I don't know what Nova would say on that. I think sure. Nova might say processed. Maybe they wouldn't say ultra processed because, I, you know, uh, in my years back when I was talking about, or I think I talked about when I had the supplement company. Um, yeah. When I had the supplement company, you know, I actually went to Minnesota. I went to uh, Land Lakes in mm. Minnesota because I had a protein produced for me and I toured their plant. I saw how it was made. And if we're talking about drying and we're talking about filtering and we're talking about things like that, where we haven't added in things, we haven't added in acid washes and we haven't added things in, but it's a drying and a filtering process. I think it, you know, you could probably, if it's just an unflavored way, you know, mm -hmm. um, sure. or it's whey isolate and cocoa. Okay. Commonly found in kitchens. Fine. You know, uh, we could say it's maybe it's just processed, but not ultra processed. Um, by the way, what that thing you and I are talking about right there, that specific food is not the reason that we have obesity. Oh, <laughs> and that's a great point. <laughs> it's like when people bring up fruit, you know, I'm like, fruit yeah, no. is not the cause of obesity. That is not. <laughs> that is not. Oh, yeah, it is, it is not. I, no. 
that that is a good point. Like, we, do we even need to talk much about it? Uh, uh, that's more of an optimization thing, right? You've got things sure. dialed in. You're like, okay, let me go to more. Even even myself, I know I occasionally have the big tubs of the cheaper protein because I got to get it in. Right. Eh, you know, I should probably spend a little more occasionally on the stuff that doesn't have the extra ingredients. Um, all right. So uh, how about how about I just I'll ask you my penultimate question that I ask all guests, and that is, what one question did you wish I had asked, and what is your answer? Wow. You know, I don't have, because I was able to at least mention the six pillars, it's important that people know that any one of those mm. could be the showstopper. And I'll reverse, I'll reverse the sentence. It could also be the difference maker in success. So it, I don't think you've missed any questions. I think that, okay, oh, all right, I'll do this one because we, 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 we looked at body positivity. What's my concern with body positivity, Dave? <laughs> what's <laughs> your you concern, Dave? Yeah, what's your answer? <laughs> yeah. So my thing is, it's, again, not the person. Absolutely not. Human, inalienable rights. Let them be. Don't judge them. You don't have a right. You also don't know if they're healthy. Right. You know, you can tell by looking at them that they may be obese. You can tell by looking at them that maybe their waist circumference as a female is greater than 35, greater than 40 as a male. Got it. But that's only one factor. So instead, instead of looking at someone and saying, that person is obviously unhealthy because they're obese, you don't know. You can't tell. You can't see mm -hmm. their biomarkers. You can't see the measurements other than the physical one uh, uh, you know, on the outside. So why am I concerned? One, I'm concerned when someone does reach the obese status. And I'm concerned because obesity is a known risk factor for increased incidence of cancer, stroke, mm -hmm. heart disease, diabetes, systemic inflammation, dementia, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, arthritis, um, autoimmune disorders, and eventual long-term care. And that's kind of part one. At the individual level, I'm concerned for the individual. I'm With body mass index defining obesity and a body mass index being 30 or greater being obese, and then there are three classes of obesity, 30 to 34.9 is class one, 35 to 35, 39.9 is class two, and 40 and up is class three. The more obese, the more likely these things are to occur. Mm -hmm. I am not as concerned, and I am not someone as a coach who says, you've got to be, uh, you've got to have a BMI of 25 or less, right. which because, you know, with under 20, 24.9, 18.5 to 24.9 is the healthy normal weight range by BMI. Um, it's the 30 and up because the research starts to get much stronger mm -hmm. um, where we start to not equivocate so much. We can equivocate with a BMI of 27, 28, whatever, and maybe the very, very lowest end of obesity. But once that starts to climb, then my concerns that I just raised are concerns for that reason. Their health is going to suffer. And then part two of that is we all are sharing the cost of the increased cost of obesity. Um, there is an increased cost of obesity. And so I'm concerned for the individual, but I also think it's unsustainable um, as a society for us to continue in the direction we are and just get to the point where we don't, as individuals, try and solve it for ourselves first because we can't wait for the top down, but eventually top down doing what they can to try to help um, you know, bring the obesity <laughs> epidemic down because you know, you're looking at, uh, obesity in the United States costing us um, what 173 million dollars, you know, extra a year. Um, someone who's obese, it costs them healthcare-wise 3,508 dollars more per year for that individual, and that's if they don't have lots of medications and in need of surgeries and kind of chronic medical care. Um, it's it's very very expensive to us all, and you know, Medicare and Medicaid pay a huge portion. Yeah. True. of the increased medical costs. Who pays for Medicare and Medicaid? We all do. Yep. There's a shared cost, tax base, you name it, but there's a shared cost in that. And so we're all paying more. I'm going to say, not because individuals have your failures as individuals, and your weak willed. I hope I've gotten the message across right. that. I don't see that at all. The messaging from top down has failed. We've created this environment that's incredibly obesogenic. We have given them the wrong information. Well, not enough of the right information. Some of it's right. Not enough of the right information. It's half cocked. It's it's influenced and biased by uh, by money, the monkey banana relationship. And so we've got these millions of people that are suffering in obesity with huge costs, huge eventual health and lifestyle and health span costs to them as individuals. 
and then huge costs to us, which I see as unsustainable. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm only really concerned on the kind of the body positivity side is for one, knock it off if you're just a mean person. Okay, don't, yep. you know, I don't care who you're doing it to stop it. Um, no one deserves that. But I am concerned for them as individuals. I'm concerned for us as a society because of the increased costs and what is actually paying for this. And again, huge, a huge amount of it is Medicare, Medicaid. Great message. And I think, is it true that anyone, no matter what state they're in today, can improve their health? Oh, gosh. Here's, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'll take it a step further. Yes. And I'm going to say this. No matter what you've been told, no matter what your family history is, no matter what your genetics are, no matter what you've been dealt or handed, you know, in life, I, I want to say, please don't give up because you absolutely can win this. You can get to any healthy weight you want and you can live there plus or minus 10 pounds, whatever, somewhere in that range. No one lives there perfectly. You can live there for life. I don't care if you're 60 listening to this. I don't care if you're mm-hmm. 19. You can get there and you can live there for life. It's it's not a wonder if you've struggled. It's not a wonder if what, with what you've heard, what top-down messaging has been, um, that you haven't achieved it yet. But don't give up because you absolutely can. You haven't done it yet, and you can. That's the message, and, and that's a great message. So thank you, David, for coming on. Where can listeners learn more about you and your work? I'll keep it simple. You know, when I when I when I name this lean this lifestyle. You know, 24 years ago, I don't, you know, if I had known I was going to be doing it this long, I probably would have made it a little easier. So uh, I just made the website a little easier and that'd be the place to go. All our links to social are there too, but it's lluniversity.com. lluniversity.com. I'll put those in the show notes so listeners can find you. David, this was a pleasure. We covered so many topics, Uh, just scratched the surface, I feel, but uh, I really thank you for coming on the show. You bet. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you've been inspired by today's interview and are ready to take action and build momentum on your health and fitness journey, just schedule a free 30-minute nutrition momentum call with me using the link in my show notes. I promise not to sell or pitch you on anything, but I will help you gain some perspective and guidance so we can get you on the right track toward looking and feeling your best.